When I was 16 years old, I decided to surprise my parents with a bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day. We've always celebrated this as a family holiday rather than a romantic one. I didn't have a car to drive to a florist, but my high school was within walking distance of a hospital boasting a gift shop that sells floral arrangements. Between classes during the week of Valentine's Day, I set off for the hospital by myself, cutting across campus to walk through a network of side roads populated with specialty doctor's offices that keep odd hours, the sort of buildings where traveling doctors mainly hold surgery consultations or perform small procedures a few times a month. The trip there passed without incident. As I was walking back through the said deserted roads with a vase of flowers in tow, I noticed an unkempt 1990s car close behind me. While my memory of the car is hazy, I am left with the impression that there were at least two men within those faces that I could not see. Initially, I assumed that the driver was simply afraid of hitting me, the reason they weren't passing by so I made a point of dramatically trudging further into the grassy shoulder of the road, demonstrating to them that they could safely drive ahead. They still refused to pass me by, continuing to creep along behind at a slow pace. Beginning to suspect that the driver was more interested in me than a destination, I began to walk faster. The car confirmed my suspicions by matching my speed, Despite the impracticality of my shoes and the threat of spilling water from my face, I commenced to run as fast as I possibly could. They hit the gas and again matched my speed. I realized at this point that the car was following me, that there was no one in sight to notice and that I needed to get away. I bolted into the first parking lot that I saw and the car turned in after me. Despite there being only two or three cars in the spacious front parking lot and there being no other sign of activity at the office, this car did not stop to park in the numerous spaces available there. The driver instead opted to pursue me into the partially under construction back portion of this lot behind the office. It passed every available parking space to corner me against a pile of debris and rubble from the construction, coming to a diagonal stop less than three feet away. Before anyone could emerge from the vehicle, I somehow managed to scale the small prominence of rubble against my back. Vase in hand, I jumped from its peak to land painfully on the other side which fortunately was a plot of underdeveloped land within sight of my high school campus. I took a quick peek back over my shoulder to see if they were still in pursuit, but the car had sped off after I reached the top of the rubble pile and was now nowhere in sight. They had not parked in the lot at all, and they had no business here. The driver was following me. I sprinted at top speed and didn't stop until I was soaked with sweat in the dead of winter and panting in a student lounge among my classmates, who didn't seem to give a damn when I told them, possibly because our hometown is supposedly a human trafficking capital and the crime rate is outrageous. Although I am convinced that this was something more of informal than human trafficking, as the dilapidated car suggested poverty, and I have read that human trafficking usually arises through grooming and not being snatched off the streets. In retrospect, I should have told an adult, alerted campus security, and called the non-emergency line of the local police station. But I was young. Foolish, insecure, and afraid of getting in trouble for leaving campus when I didn't have a signed permission form permitting me to do so. I kept trying to convince myself that I had misread the situation or I was overreacting. I don't know what I would have even told the police had I called them, 
as I was entirely ignorant on the subject of cars and couldn't have identified the make of it had I been asked, and I couldn't see the faces of the occupants. I was also worried that my parents would restrict my already extremely limited freedoms if they knew that I had been in any danger. I feel horrible for having never told anyone, and I earnestly hope that my secrecy hasn't led to someone being hurt or killed. I believe the only missing people, aside from runaway children or elderly adults with dementia in this city right now, though, are men aside from one woman a few decades ago. So, whoever followed and tried to trap a 16-year-old girl with flowers at a doctor's office just before Valentine's Day of 2016, let's not meet. This guy took pictures of me and my cousin, so I was like, what, 10 or 11? And my younger cousin, which I had lived with, was about 5. We were outside waving bye to my dad as he left for work. There was this dude walking down the sidewalk towards us with this foxtail charm on his purse, I guess you would call it. He had brownish-black hair, and his sunglasses were propped up on top of his head. We weren't on the sidewalk or near it, he was on the other side of the road. He waved at us, and out of politeness, I smiled back as a hi, but then he started walking across the road towards us. He claimed to know my auntie Carmen, and later, I would know this is true. He was talking to us and asking how old we were and how we were doing and stuff. I answered I was doing fine and walked backward a bit, hoping he'd get the hint and leave me and my cousin alone. I hated my cousin's guts, but like hell I was going to let her get kidnapped, or worse. He walked towards me again. He asked if he could take a video of us saying how we loved our mom, even though it's my aunt, and to huddle together. This was odd, and an obvious red flag, but I didn't know what to do and was nervous about what he might do if I didn't comply. So I did. Luckily, my grand came out cause like, what are you supposed to do when you see your granddaughters outside getting filmed by some creep? But it wasn't some creep. She actually knew this guy. He went to high school with my uncle and aunt. I guess this was when they were together and found out they had a kid via Facebook or something. But they talked about how he was getting into fashion and blah 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 small talk. Then my gran asked why he was videotaping me and my cousin. He used the same excuse he used with me and my cousin. She told him to get off our lawn and delete the video. I don't remember if she watched him delete it or not, but he did leave. And he did live close. I was scared to ride my bike alone around the neighborhood for a while. And I wonder what he actually did with that video, because, like hell, I believed he sent it to my aunt. I hope I never see that fuck ever again. Looking back on it, what a corny and oddly specific way to greet two kids you're trying to kidnap. But damn, did it almost work. I was probably 8 years old at that time, and every week, I watched WWF Wrestling on TV with my dad. Yeah, I do. I answered, as a 30-something man that I had never seen before continued to approach my friend and I. We were at a local elementary school for a little league baseball game. While my friend's brother played baseball, we played on the playground and ran around the asphalt blacktop. The closest adults were probably 500 yards away. He didn't have any kids with him, no children of his own, or anything like that. I didn't think anything of it back then, but that really sticks out now. Who's your favorite wrestler? He asked, standing just a feet from us, his hands shoved in his pockets and assumingly. Oh, I like the big show and stone called Steve Austin. I replied, 
I had always been a sociable kid, and still am sociable all these years later. I had never met a stranger, as the saying goes, and as ironic as it is in this context. My friend, who was much more shy, stood there silently. Oh, I like him too, replied the stranger. Hey, I have a bunch of wrestling videos at my house. Do you want to come watch them? Mm, I don't know about that, I replied. Not because I had a bad feeling about the situation, but because my mom has always made me promise her to never go anywhere with a stranger. Oh, come on. It'll be fun. Plus, I have a dog who loves kids. Let's go. I'll take you to my truck. For some reason, I felt the need to know this guy's name. Not that it would have made a difference had he chosen to snatch us then and there. It was before cell phones were really popular. We definitely didn't have one. What's your name? I asked. He laughed. More huffed, really, before telling me his name was Junior. Junior what? I asked. All of a sudden... A worried look came over his face, like me asking for his real name was all it took to shake him off his plan. Hey, never mind, you'll have a good day. And he began to hurry away, and we turned around and made our way back to the baseball game. We never told my friend's mom, and we never talked about it either. It wasn't until a few years ago, as a matter of fact, that the memory randomly popped into my head and I realized the guy was trying to kidnap us the whole time. I'll never know what foiled his plan, but I'm glad things went down the way they did. Apologies in advance for mobile formatting and a longish story, but it hasn't stopped nagging at me since I found this thread. You know when you look back at your teenage years and say, I shouldn't be alive. This is that. For context, the street I lived on was in rural New England, occupied mostly by families and completely without streetlights. It was quiet and empty by 11pm. At 13 years old, I was going through a big rebellious phase. I'd sneak out with my friends at night and we'd walk about two miles to the nearest gas station to get snacks, smoking weed along the way. On this particular night, I'd gotten into a fight with my mom. I waited until she was asleep, around 1am, and snuck out the window alone. I usually didn't make this walk solo, but I was heated. And to the best of my knowledge, I lived in a small, safe, rural town. I was halfway down the road when a pair of headlights pulled up behind me. I didn't think much of it until they slowed down and stopped. It was a rickety farm truck, the kind you can hear rumbling and creaking from a distance. The solo male driver rolled down his window to introduce himself. He told me his name, uh, I wish I remembered, asked for mine, and stuck out a hand for a handshake, very clearly trying to get me to approach his vehicle. I was already pretty skeeved by his small talk, but was more afraid of being rude than kidnapped, so my dumbass walked up and shook it. Looking back, he could have pulled me in right then and there, but he didn't. So this weird middle-aged man is leering at me heavy and asking me what I do for fun. Did I want to have some? Where am I going? And could he give me a ride? Do I live around here? I took a few big steps back and thumbed at the random house behind me, telling him I lived there, and was returning home, and my parents were expecting me. At this point, I'm aware I'm in danger, but trying not to show him that I'm spooked. After I rebuffed his offer for a ride a few more times, and turned back towards my house, he sped off like burning rubber fast. I tried to get his license plate, but it was too dark, so I just watched him drive away, relieved. Until he pulled into a roundabout driveway and started speeding back towards me. I turned 
and fucking leapt behind this stone wall in front of my house and army crawled over to a bunch of trees. From behind this wall, in the fetal position, I hear the truck slow down again and stop. This is the worst fucking part. The truck door slams shut and the driver's feet hit the pavement. He walks around, pacing the section of the street I'd been in, clearly looking for me. It felt like he did this for ages. I was sure he'd find me behind the stone wall, only a few feet from where we had spoken. But after a while, he must have believed I went home, because he got back in his truck and drove off. My hand comes off my mouth and the tears start coming. I'm about to get up when I hear his truck turn around again. This freak cruises back up the street at a crawl three more times times before he finally drives off in the direction he'd come from in the first place. I waited another 15 minutes before getting up. I was too afraid to get back on the road so I snuck through people's backyards until I came to my house. I ran in my back door to find my brother playing video games, surprised to see me. He had no idea I'd even left. If this creep had succeeded in what seems to be an attempted opportunistic abduction, nobody would have known I was gone until the next morning. I don't know what this guy's plan was for me, but it didn't seem innocent. So stranger on the street in your rickety farm truck, let's not meet again. I was living in Abu Dhabi when this happened and I was 17 years old at that time. I've had a number of experiences from taxi drivers out there that could fit on the sub, but this one was by far the worst and creepiest, and I'd like to share it with you all. It was Boxing Day 2012, and I was going to my friend's house for his Boxing Day party. He lived in a compound that was a bit of a drive off the island itself, and although not rural suburbs by most standards, this area could be classed as such. These residential suburbs were also still mostly in development. Every block had a new building site, plenty of empty shells of houses, no security cameras at that time, and etc. There were no pavements either, just rubble and sand patches split by tarmac roads. Now, Taxis in the UAE are crazy common, you just put your hand out and one pulls up. And back then, there was less security, there were no cameras or mics in the car, just the meter. I hailed the cab and sat in the front, as a result of a past experience that I had, and then we sat on our way. Things start normally, we talked as I normally would getting into a cab. How long have you lived here? Do you enjoy the place? And etc. Eventually, we're on the highway, and after we cross the water to the mainland, he pulls over on the hard shoulder, and without saying a word to me, pulls out his phone and calls someone. He is speaking his native tongue, and he's of South Asian descent, so I have no clue what he's saying. But... I ask him politely to continue driving, as the meter is still on. He nods, hangs up, and gets going again. This happens a second time, again, without word or warning. And now, I'm suspicious. This time, I ask him again to keep going, but he ignores me, and he keeps talking on the phone. We're on the highway so I can't get out for fear of going splat, not being able to hail a cab, or being jacked for jaywalking. After a few minutes, he gets going again, and we pull off the highway, still heading the direction that I needed to be. We reach the first roundabout where we need to make a right turn, but he goes straight over, Everyone knows where this compound is, it's the biggest one in the city, and as a cab driver, there is no chance that he doesn't know how to get there. So now, I'm even more suspicious, 
and I kind of have a feeling of trepidation. Like I know this vibe and what might be happening. I ask him to turn around at the next roundabout, but he ignores me. Now, I'm getting agitated and angry, and I ask him to just stop the car and I'll get out and walk. Nope, he literally just ignored me and kept focusing on the road. At this point, I'm shouting at him, numerous expletives and many more, and it's clear that he's got something else planned. Eventually, he pulls off the main road onto a dirt track that led a couple of hundred yards into a massive building site and he keeps driving down it. He then turns to me and tells me to get into the back seat and repeats this in an increasingly forceful manner to the point that we were shouting at each other. At the end of the dirt track is an old little minibus with roughly five dudes that stood next to it. I don't notice this immediately, and all I care about is that the car has stopped and I'm in front so I can get out. I'm not locked in. Inexplicably, I threw some money at him and jumped out of the car with my bag and started walking away, jogging back down the track. I can only imagine that the earlier phone calls he made were to these minibus men, as when I started getting away, they jump in the minibus and drive down to catch me, as the taxi turns around and does the same. They all pull up in front of me, like the police do in the movies when they stop a bank robber and jump out. The taxi driver runs right up to me, grabs me, and screams point blank at my face to get in the bus. I can still smell and feel the damp heat from his breath as it touched my face and the little bits of his spit hitting my cheeks. This honestly just enraged me, so I grabbed him by the throat and pushed him against his car. I screamed something back at him. I can't remember what and then let go. They all get their phones out and start calling and messaging and moving towards me, so I just got out of there as fast as I could. I ran all the way down and back onto the main road and went to my mates on foot. I know, I should have taken the number plate or ID number, etc., and called the police even when I was in the cab, let alone after it happened. However, I was a 17-year-old with a bottle of Jack Daniels in my bag on the way to a party with all my mates drinking in a Muslim country with a drinking age of 21. The paranoia of the trouble from that was enough to keep it quiet from the authorities, although I did tell every family member and friend. So yeah, if I could never meet you and your little mini Buzz posse again, that would be great. This happened when I was in my early 20s. I was working in a retail store in a mall, but there wasn't enough hours, so I asked if there was anything else I could do, and my boss told me that the location at the other mall needed more help, so I could go there on my weekend. I decided to take the bus route that was a bit longer, but that I didn't have to make any transfers, so I got up early and caught the earliest one I could. The bus ride was fairly normal. I got to see parts of my city that I hadn't seen before. I did notice that the bus eventually went into a more dingy neighborhood. There was more trash everywhere, abandoned buildings, houses and cars, and etc. I noticed it, but I felt like I was safely on the bus and my destination was in a nice neighborhood. At some point, an elderly lady got on the bus and I noticed that no one was getting up to offer her a seat, so I gave her mine and went to go hold the pole near at the side door of the bus and continued on my way. While riding, I remember looking at a guy next to me and asking if he knew about how much longer it would take to get to my stop, but before he answered, someone hit the buzzer to get off 
the doors next to me opened. And then I felt hands on my free arm grabbing me and pulling me. I, on reflex, immediately clenched up because I generally do not like any physical contact with strangers outside of a greeting handshake. And I really think that reflex saved my life because it took my brain a few seconds to register that someone was trying to pull me off the bus. A tall man in a white tank top, blue jeans, and white tennis shoes had come out of the back of the bus, grabbed my arm, and tried to drag me off the bus. He had pulled me down to the second step before I even understood what was going on, and I was just barely still hanging on to the pole. The arm he was grabbing had my purse on it, and I actually tried to shake my purse down to him, so he'd let go but he had no interest in my purse. I had just started about calling for help when I felt someone grab my waist and pull me back towards the bus. The man trying to pull me down must have realized that he couldn't get me without this dragging out longer than he expected. So he finally gave up and ran off. And that was it. The guy ran off and the door shut and I vaguely remember hearing the man who saved me say something along the lines of, You would die in that neighborhood. And I had apparently gone into some kind of shock because I only remember saying, Oh, I don't even remember thanking him, and I didn't say anything to the driver. I didn't contact the police like I should have, and I don't even remember my shift at the other location. I don't remember the ride home. It was like I was numb. It was when I was at home, had completely showered, and gotten ready for my bed in my nightgown, that I sat at the edge of my bed and thought, Did I almost get kidnapped? I almost got kidnapped. I have a lot of regrets about all of this. I regret not contacting the police in case that guy goes after another woman. At least, women would be aware that he was out there. And I regret not thanking and keeping in contact with the nice person who saved me. I actually posted an article in my local CL in hopes of him somehow hearing it and knowing how grateful I am to him. Well, anyway, to the guy that tried to take me off the bus, let's not meet, and I hope... You got caught. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. I would also like to thank my following patrons. Ralph, Jake, Fire05, Gabriel, Moschino, Lori, Eskimono, and Matt's Chats. Thank you very, very much. I really do appreciate it. If you want to support the channel further, you can be a patron too. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet. And comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.